Hello, everyone, and welcome into episode 17 of the Big Ten Watchdog News Podcast, episode three of season two. I'm one of your hosts. I am Graham Dynas. And I am Taylor Seymour. We've got a lot to talk about today about the Big Ten over the past couple of weeks and with Feast Week coming up next week. A um, lot, lot to get into, but before we do that, just want to to plug our social medias uh, and other platforms in in the description of wherever you're watching this or listening to this video. Uh, Apple, Spotify, YouTube, all available, um, as well as you can find us on Twitter, where we uh, do a lot of our like game analysis and and news stories that we that we want to talk about. Find uh, find those on Twitter. Also follow us on TikTok going to start posting some clips there um all of those will be in the link tree in the description uh so just visit that that link that's posted and then from there it'll it'll allow you to to visit us at any one of those sites also make sure to to leave a like and subscribe uh wherever you're watching um and yeah i think think that's about it uh so let's jump into our recap uh of the first two weeks of, of the college basketball season in the big 10 um, and the biggest story in the Big Ten thus far has definitely been uh, Michigan State and the woes that they have have had thus far in the season. Uh, obviously, starting with the the opening night upset to James Madison uh, in the Breslin Center in East Lansing, uh, that was that was massive. Um, as well as dropping the game in Chicago to Duke, uh, which you know is whatever. I mean, Duke, Duke's pretty good. We we talked about that game in the last episode that that would be a pretty good one. Um, I don't know. Taylor, what are your, what are your thoughts on, I guess let's start with the James Madison game. I know it's been two weeks now. It's, it's kind of old news, but still probably the most important game of the season thus far in the big 10. Yeah. I didn't get to watch um, a lot of the game. I turned it out at the end to see what was going on when I heard that they were down because I thought surely there's no way they're going to be down to this. It's not a game I need to, you know, pay, close attention to but yet here we ended up um but i think that this game and the duke game show that although in duke they kind of pulled it out a little better um and some other mid-major games that michigan state played they just can't shoot the ball they can they can hold their teams to 50 60 points but they just can't score and you can't win college best division one high major college basketball games if you only score 60 points. Yeah, you know, we talked about the absence of Joey Hauser and how he was their most consistent shooter. We talked about that in the preseason. Um, and yeah, that's one of the questions that I, that I was going to pose is how are they going to be able to fix these shooting issues? Uh, in the game they played yesterday, they played Alcorn State. Uh, leading scorer was Trey Holloman who was filling in for an injured Tyson Walker, uh, who came off the, I guess he didn't, he started, um, I want to say five for five on threes. Um, and so that may be, you know, a potential solution to the problem is more Trey Holland in minutes. But at the same time, you know, you have such a good backcourt already. You're, you're going to have to squeeze time in for him. And, you know, he's, is he going to be able to keep that consistency or is it going to have to be, you know, kind of a, a platoon of guys, you know, just kind of you have to find the hot hand on any given day. That's that's kind of the the dilemma that, that Izzo's facing right now. Well, they played Alcorn State. I mean, you and I could go out and shoot five for five against Alcorn State. I don't know if I would take that as a... I don't know, think we could. I, I, season I, setter for the rest of the year. I, I don't think. I think we could go. We could go one for five. You You, you might be able to go two for five, I think. I'm just I'll, saying, I, mean, I think that, I think that level happens. level of competition mean I mean can sway your stats dramatically. Yeah, no, that, that's fair. It, it, um, Alcorn State's a low major, um, low major school, but yeah, it is nice to see that at least they they made some shots because they didn't make shots against James Madison, who is ranked now, but even still, you know, a decent Sun Belt team. You're probably looking at a 13 seed in the tournament uh, if they end up winning that that conference. So, so yeah, and then the champ, Champions Classic game against Duke, they came out pretty flat. Um, they picked it up midway through the second half, and this game was running simultaneous to the Marquette-Illinois game, 
So I was, you know, keeping one eye on that and while having most of my attention on that game, but it do kind of pulled away. It just kind of seemed like same problems there, just lack of, of guys that can go score. And so that poses another question who, who's going to step up to be that second score or are they going to have to rely on that, you know, platoon hot hand? Um, I think Jay Nakins should be the guy. I know I've been on the Malik Hall train the past year and a half now, but I think Jay Nakins is the most likely candidate for that. What do you think? Uh, I mean, I think that really it's going to have to be play the hot hand of the night. I don't know. You can pick one guy. I mean, I'm just looking at these here. Akins was the worst guy on the team in the Duke game at minus 12. Yeah, that's not promising. But, I mean, yeah, that – I don't even know. Like, I he's he's going to have – I mean, he has to play. I don't know, but they're deep, you know, and they have freshmen. And Izzo mentioned that after the James Madison presser. He, he said that, you know, the freshmen came out, they wanted to play Cohen Carr and – Jeremy Fears and Xavier Booker, those are the guys that, you know, came out and played with some some hustle. And he wasn't afraid to, to play them. And, you know, they, they've each found, you know, their share of minutes here or there. But there's just – there's so much depth, but no true, like, you know, like really strong second option behind Tyson Walker offensively. And so that's going to be a problem. I mean, there. Yeah. They've got 50 – they've got – 10 more games to figure it out before they really need to turn the switch on. Um, I, I think Izzo is a great, a good enough coach that he can find a guy in 10 games, plus all the practices between there that can be the guy that he looks to when the big 10 season starts. I have no, I have no doubt that they will find somebody who can, you know, step up in some fashion. Um, but it, it is semi concerning that um, these struggles are so prevalent, even against, not super great teams. Uh, So I think this team was a little overrated coming into the year. I would say, what are the expectations now? Do we obviously like one or two seed, you know, one of the two best teams in the big 10 early. I still like think they're probably one of the the, the three, four best teams in the big 10, Uh, but that may be more of an indictment on the whole conference than it is like a vote of confidence in Michigan state. Um. Yeah. What do you think? Are the yeah? I was gonna say that I think that it's it's really just that the rest of the Big Ten is so bad that Michigan State can easily finish top five and not really have to sweat it. Yeah. Yeah. I think we're looking at something similar to last year, maybe on a on a lesser scale. I think the conference. I mean, it's been two weeks. It's November, and there, there's time to change it. But seems as of now. We're looking at another year where you look at Purdue being a high end team, and what last year we had Indiana as a as a four, and Michigan State was a seven. Everyone else was around just like a bunch of teams at the seven eight nine line. Um, I think we might see something you know maybe a, a worse outcome than that at this point, point. Um, and Michigan State might be that that four or five seed type team. Um, but, yeah, I mean, again, it's early. There's so much time left in the, in the season. Um, and, you know, who needs who, – who's glad to hear that there's a lot of time left in the season to turn around is the Maryland Terrapins. You know, preseason to pick to finish third in the Big Ten. Um, and they are one in three, losers of three straight, including back-to-back drops against mid-major schools in Davidson and UAB in Asheville, followed by just – a steady throttling by Villanova in the Hakeem Hart revenge game in in the Gavit game. So, um, yeah, I mean, I just I just want to know your thoughts because you've been pretty adamant, not adamant, but like vocal on Twitter about how bad this Maryland team has looked thus far. Um, I watched I a good portion. It. I watched a good portion of that Villanova game. And I didn't think they were going to get to 30 points on the night. It was brutal. Like, it is worse than watching, like, your local high school, like, JV team before the varsity team comes out. It is – there is no movement. There's no scoring. They just – and, like, clearly they can't stop anybody. Well, I mean, 
they're only giving up 60, but when you can only score half of that, you got to do a little, you got to do a little better. Yeah. And so you lose Hakeem Hart, who was the second or third leading scorer from that team last year. But even still, like, I feel like you're bringing in Deshaun Harris Smith, who is, I believe he might have been the highest rated recruit in the conference coming in. He was, he was up there at the bare minimum. Um, do we think that him maybe growing into a role would would be a help for this team? Or do we think that regardless, it's it's just going to not – they're not going to be able to replicate what they did last year? Well, I think they're not going to be able to replicate. Just from what I've seen, it's been so – painfully awful I don't know that anybody any single one person could step up and save this team like it's gonna have to be a full-fledged team step up to make any sort of progress I'd say Jameer Young would be the guy that like if if you if there was if you're gonna put all the weight on one guy in the conference not named Zach Eady to do that for a team I think Jameer Young would probably be he might be the guy I'd pick for that um but even at even at uh, even against the mid major competition they've been playing, he's only averaging thirteen a game. Yeah, it's, it's got to be level. like he's got to be averaging like twenty to give him a chance. Um, one thing that we talked about at length last year ad nauseum, um, they were a completely different team on the road than they were at home. In the Xfinity Center, they were tremendous, and and whenever they left the Xfinity Center, they were not. Um, and so you get Davidson and UAB on a neutral court. You get Villanova in the pavilion. Um, none of those games in in Annapolis, uh, not Annapolis, in College Park. Um, and so you're losing three games not on the road, or three games on the road. Um, so I don't know, maybe just the, the demons of Kevin Willard from Seton Hall uh, going into Villanova and having no success, uh, I've, are, they carried over. I don't know. I just think this team, I feel like they're going to go out and they're going to win games at home that they shouldn't, maybe. But, again, like seeing the the third rank in the preseason poll for the conference, that just does not even seem remotely achievable at this point. No, and they've got uh, a home test on Tuesday – They've got three and two UMBC, the darlings of the tournament. And the Golden Retrievers coming to coming to uh, College Park. So I think we'll know a lot more about them come Tuesday, whether or not they can win at home against a above five hundred mid major team. These okay, so Davidson and UAB, they're not the losses that are going to end your season. Uh, they're obviously not going to help on any resumes. But both of those programs are are solid enough mid majors. But when you stack those losses, you know that that's kind of a rough look. Do you think that this team will be able to overcome those losses and make their way into the tournament field, regardless? Or do or I, do you, like what's it going to take for that to happen? I haven't seen any indication in the three previous games or any of them for that matter. When they, I mean, they got beat by, um, or yeah, it's, um, I want to say, what's the nicest way to put this? Not, it's going to be a long year. It's going to be a long year. That's what you said on, you said that on Twitter. That was your, those are the words you used. Yeah. And I think it's, March is a long way away and it's going to, the winter is going to be, Luckily, it's a little milder in Maryland than it is here, in Michigan at least, so maybe there's something you can do outside to forget about the Terrapins basketball game. But I think I think that what it, I think this Maryland team, what they're going to be this year, is they're going to be stressful is the word I would use um, because they're going to – they're going to play a lot of low-scoring, pretty close games. They're – probably going to win a few that they maybe shouldn't. They're probably going to lose a few that they definitely shouldn't. Um, and so I think that they're going to be a team that in March, you know, they're going to be on that fringe. They're going to be 10 and 10 in the conference from just from what I can tell. I think that they'll turn around at least a little bit, but um, it's, I don't know. I think that it's just going to be a stressful season for Maryland Terrapin fans. And 
I wish them the best of luck. I hope that's not the case. I hope that they're a strong tournament team. But there's just not a ton of indication that that's going to be the case. Um, is it, Do you have any, like, closing thoughts on Maryland or you, you want to? No, I think that's pretty – I think it's I pretty clear where I stand at this point. Yeah, uh-huh. Let's, let's talk about Michigan briefly. Um, really, really strong start to the season for, for the Phil Martelli-led uh, Michigan Wolverines, especially in the offensive end. That was kind of the, the question mark about this team was who's going to be the guy on offense? Are they going to be able to produce? They, they looked really good um, up until Friday night against Long Beach State, which the offense still looks pretty good. I mean, right, 86 against Long Beach State, but that's a tough loss at home. Um it's not nearly as bad as the 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 what the Central Michigan is it Central or is it Eastern Central last year, Central. Um, and it's just the one game, uh, so like there's a lot of time to to resurrect or to to dr- drop the the meaning of this game. But I'm just gonna kind of let you cook on Michigan here because you've watched a lot more of their basketball than I have. Um, yeah, so it's kind of it's the same problem that they had last year. Um, they can score with you all game, but they'll give up uh, 80 again too because they play no defense. They don't rebound. They turn the ball over. Um, but when they're not doing that, they are highly efficient on offense. I mean, people just jack from three and it goes in. I mean, I've I've seen Doug do more step backs this year than like anyone else in my entire life, and it's only been four games. Um, the amount of shots that Trey Jackson or Kamwa just get open in the corner that don't come within inches of hitting the rim are insane. Um, But on the defensive end, there's just no effort. Um, Doug plays semi well off the, uh, on the point, uh, but down low uh, Cheddar still fouls too much. Um, Whether or not I think he just plays a little physical and the, the refs don't like it. Uh, I'm not sure they're exactly all fouls. Um, Reed, again, he plays fine when his guy's got the ball, but um, if somebody else shoots the ball, he's not boxing out. He's we're giving up offensive rebounds and layups. Um, and then turning the ball over. It's something we did last year a lot. Uh, just throwing it loosey-goosey around and giving up transition points that way. Um and all of those, those are the easy things to clean up. You can easily clean up defense and turnovers. It's a lot harder to clean up offense when the ball is not dropping. Um, so I think the the outlook is still high for this team. But if they don't clean that up, they're going to be in for a similar season as last year. They're going to beat people that they should, and they're going to lose people they should, and not really have any sort of defining characteristic about them. I still think, even with the, the LBSU lost, I still think – this team has improved their outlook from where they were looked at in the preseason. Um, and that may just be, you know, again, some of these big 10 teams that were ranked ahead of them earlier, are just plummeting uh, in the projected standings. But I, I feel like offensively, this team's a lot better off than where I thought they'd be. And so, so that's good. Just like watching the first, what, like eight minutes of the St. John's game and the Gavit where, I mean, it was just like a track meet, and they're going back and forth, and Amari Burnett, you know, knocking down shots. Um, I don't know. Like, it's – this team might be the most fun team in the Big Ten, and there's something to be said about that. Um, and I think that they're they're still looking at a, a decent, you know, you know, maybe bump them up to like a, a 10 or an 11 in, in the early um, – in the early preseason bracket projections. One – thing that I brought up to you was the difference between the Phil Martelli led team and the Juwan Howard led team. And that this was before the, the, the loss. Um, I just kind of, I felt like the Martelli team played a little bit more. I don't want, I want to say like together that may have that I'm certain it has a lot to do with Hunter Dickinson being on the court versus not being on the court. I kind of want to know where you stand on that now, if there's, just like what what what's your outlook on the Phil Martelli versus Juwan Howard kind of debate? Uh, well, I think that it is um, the team this year compared to last year is a prime example. We could rename the Ewing effect the Dickinson effect, um, and we there would be no difference. Um, 
in definition. Uh, this team is very definitely very more cohesive uh, without Hunter. Um, but I also think that the coaching styles of Phil and Jawan uh, make it such that um, Phil's going to let you know when you mess up, whereas Jawan is has more of the NBA mindset where it's like you're gonna you're gonna play how you're gonna play, and we're just gonna work around it. Um, and both of them have their place, but I think that's kind of why you see differences when one coaches versus the other. Yeah, no, I, I'd agree with that. And you mentioned also the, the recruiting difference because I was just like, I feel like this team seems to be better off with Phil Martelli at the helm than Jawan Howard. I'm a known Jawan hater, um, but even objectively, I feel like this team just looks better with Phil Martelli. Um, but yeah, you brought up the recruiting aspect, and that's obviously, you know, a huge part of of winning in any sport at the college level. And Jawan Howard is has proven to be a very very strong recruiter, and so. I I don't know. I I just was just going to kind of defer to you and see see where you stood on that debate. Uh, I don't mind having either of them as the coach. Um, really, um, it's I would maybe prefer it how it kind of is now, where Martelli runs the team and Jawan just recruits on the back end and gets the five star guys to come. Um, but no, I think both of them are are well qualified. Obviously Martelli has a story history and Jawan won the, the Big Ten like what is first year, second year? So Yeah. Early. Yeah. One of the one of the first two for sure. Um all right, let's talk about Indiana uh and how they have just been to put it plainly, just very unimpressive early. Um they I'm gonna pull up their schedule, but it's been a lot of close games to a lot of inferior opponents. Uh, you take a look. Game one was against Florida Gulf Coast. All, all three games at home, a six-point win against FGCU, an eight-point win against Army, and then a nine-point win against a pretty rough Wright State team. All at home before they go yesterday on Sunday to Madison Square Garden and just get throttled by the defending champs and the Connecticut Huskies. Um, we kind of had the question of who's going to step up for this team. And right now, like Kalel Ware has had a couple good games and, and Malik Renault has been, you know, marginally okay. Um, but this team doesn't even, I don't think, hold a candle to last year's team with, with TJD and, and race and Miller cop, all those guys that left. Oh, not at all. Not at all. These guys, um, we knew this team was going to be interesting going in. We talked about that in the preseason analysis. Um, And, yeah, they haven't lived up to expectation particularly. They could have lost. I mean, they've had single digits to all of the teams that they beat and lost by 20 to the University of Connecticut. Um, But I think the one thing that most stands out to me is Mike Woodson. Um, when games would get close, he was not afraid to sit the older guys who weren't playing well and put in the the, the young freshmen or the transfers, uh, which I think show, says a lot about him and what he's there to do for Indiana. Uh, so I think long term that they'll be fine um, because he's there and he wants to he wants to win rather than please people, um, which has been the one shining light of the team so far this year. Yeah, I've been on record being a fan of what Mike Woodson has done in his first first couple of years at, at Indiana. One guy I want to talk about, I, I don't know how much of, of their games you've watched, but Gabe Cups. Have you have you do you know about Gabe Cups? He um backup guard uh just comes in just super, super freakishly annoying. Pesky defender, you know, makes hustle plays. He's that kind of guy that the Big Ten's kind of been lacking recently. Um, and he's a freshman, and he's one of the guys that's been playing in, in these big time big time spots, despite not you know being a highly ranked guy. Um, he's averaging twenty minutes a game, um, but the Big Ten's just I feel like last year not having Brad Davison, you know, and I mean I guess on the he, record as a as a Brad Davison hater. Yeah, by the way. there hasn't been you know that that white guard you know the Duke guard kind of thing the the Duke white guy phenomenon the guy that everyone hates in the conference 
And, you know, I feel like Hunter Dickinson tried to be that guy. Uh, I don't think he's very good at it, despite being pretty good at basketball. Um, but Gabe Cups, he's not going to be that guy this year, but I think we're going to, we're seeing the, the guy who is, the torch has been passed on to. And I'm excited about that. Another thing, uh, Mackenzie Mbako, he, uh, NBA talent coming in as a freshman, averaging 5.3 points a game, uh, averaging 20 minutes a game. He's a guy that Mike Woodson sat in clutch spots because he's not really, you know, been contributing at that high level, especially uh, defensively, but offensively he's been kind of non-existent as well. And so that's a situation that I think it's important to monitor because uh, he he had legit NBA hype, and right now it's it's not looking as if it's that was warranted at least early. Well, maybe if he spent more time in the gym and less time at Taco Bell at two in the morning getting arrested, Mike Woodson would be able to trust him in late game situations. I kind of knew that that was where you were going to go with that. Um, yeah, no, I mean, sure, but um. Just in general, so we they were projected to finish sixth, I believe. Um, where do you think this team falls in in the Big Ten outlook at this point? Do we think – I feel like they're probably in about the same spot, no? I think so, just because the bottom of the conference is so bad. I'd put them maybe seven or eight, but I don't think they fall too terribly far just because the rest of the conference isn't that good. Yeah, so starting on Twitter, uh, I guess probably in the next – week or so Taylor is going to have you know shameless play he's going to be putting out his his own power rankings and so we'll we'll have like a firm answer on where where we think Indiana is in, on the in the conference uh whenever those release uh maybe like at some point during feast week or maybe after um but yeah again I like we have the tournament rankings that'll be coming starting around the start of conference season like true conference season um, but until then, we'll just be power ranking, you know, the conference. Yeah. Given the fact that they are currently losing to in, to Louisville, oh. I may have to revise that number. Oh, yeah. See, that's that's a bad spot. As we record this, they are down uh, about nine minutes into the game against Louisville. Still early. Still very early. Um, they, they, yeah, they, 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 there's time. They can come back in that game. Um but yeah, no this this Madison Square Garden little shootout, this two game tournament through the first forty nine minutes of basketball has not been a good luck for Indiana. Um, okay, now let's uh let's just kind of recap all of the Gavit games. Um, the Big Ten goes four and four in the Gavit. Uh, they they went two and zero on day one. They went zero and three on day two. Then they. They win game the one game on Wednesday and then split on I believe Friday, yeah Friday. There are no games on Thursday. So Purdue beats Xavier, um in Mackey. That's just kind of what you expect to see, but they looked pretty good doing it. Did you did you catch any of that one? Uh, I didn't catch a whole lot of it just because I knew that they I wouldn't have to worry about them. Yeah. Um, I think the final score was a little closer than I thought, but I don't think that reflected how the game went from what I could tell. No, no, it was it was a pretty dominant outing, I would say. And Xavier, they they played a great game and they kept themselves in it. They're they're looking pretty strong um in the big east. They look like they'll be a mid-tier contender. Um, but yeah, no, Purdue, especially at home in Mackey, that's kind of a lock, I would say, against a, a team like that. Um, and then Michigan against St. John's, we we didn't go deep into that game, just talked about it briefly, but talk about a track meet. Again, just a lot of early offense there. Uh, yeah, this is a game that we had a, uh, a Maze Rage watch party for, actually. And it was a little stressful there in the first five, ten minutes of the game when um, Michigan couldn't seem to score. Um, and then all of a sudden, Damari Burnett just – pulls one out of nowhere and goes off for like 20 of his own. And then we were up by like 10 at the half. So um, that was an interesting game to watch. And I thought it would be the, the, you know, final, final hill Michigan needed to, to, to take before they could take the next step. And then they went and lost on Long Beach. So I'm 
still up in the air on these guys. Yeah. No, I, again, I'd, I'd like to, I like to personally outweigh like a good, a good win over a bad loss. I know that the committee is going to favor that bad loss more just because there are less bad losses than good wins. Um, but I, I, I like to take the high, the highest outlook. I like to look at the, the, the ceiling of teams early. And this Michigan team, again, like I said earlier, just seems to be super fun at the bare minimum, even if they aren't, you know, at the, the tier one of the Big Ten. Um, Tuesday, 0-3, starting with Wisconsin. I'm kind of scared for this Wisconsin team. They got beat by 13 by Providence. It was, I believe, at the Duncan, the Dunk in, in Providence. But they, they just... Similar to last year, they don't have the high-end athletes to to make a, a true impact on the offensive end, um, and they just move kind of slow. It's like, I don't, and they don't have the guy on offense. Um, for a team that was projected to finish in the top half of the conference, that result kind of scares me, as well as their result against Tennessee, where they lost. Uh, yeah, I would. It's like the typical Wisconsin story, though is they just recruit all of these, like, fundamental dudes who can play great basketball but don't have the, like, it factor to go make a shot when you need it. Yeah, no, I mean, well, typically they do have that guy, and that's what this current form of Wisconsin basketball the past two years has been lacking, and that's why they haven't been as good as the teams had been whenever they were winning the conference with Johnny Davis or whenever they were playing in national championship games, obviously with Frank Kaminsky. Um, This team just like Tyler wall was maybe supposed to be that guy, but it seems pretty apparent that he's not. Um, And like they, I like all the guys they have starting, but they're all good supporting pieces and together the sum of the parts, they don't fit exactly right to where, this is a really solid team. It's just a team that's just not quite good enough to get over the hump. Is the seat getting warm in Madison if they don't uh, make the tournament again this year? I posed that question earlier. If they don't make the tournament, I'd say yeah. Um, I think they will make the tournament still, maybe as a fringe team, because because they're gonna hopefully they're healthier this year than they were last year. Um, but yeah, I think despite Gray Guard, you know, winning like eight Big Ten regular season titles in like six years. Um, He still has yet to have any, you know, true success in March outside of what, maybe the sweet 16 in 2017 where they lost to Purdue on that buzzer beater. Is that the furthest? I think they, they had that buzzer beater over Xavier too with Bronson Koenig. That was a sweet 16 year, but yet to make an elite eight, I'm pretty sure in the guard era. So Something to keep an eye out on. I think that he'll probably be fine, though. But if they're on the low end of the spectrum for possible outcomes of the season, I could see that being a possibility. Illinois dropped their game at home against Marquette, 71-64, number four in the country, Marquette. Um, I'm not thrilled with this outcome. It's early, and it's obviously not a bad loss. Um, But... A lot of the issues that the team faced in this game happen to be the same issues that this team faced last year. And that kind of scares me for the future. Obviously, the lack of a point guard, um, less than ideal. But it's the defensive side of the ball that was the real problem. You ha- you took you took issue to the team chucking up a lot of threes. I was more of the, they were good threes. So go for it. Um, my issue was more so with we can't guard an elite perimeter guy like Tyler Kolick. And he, you know, just torched us in that game. For well, that points. was very apparent. He was just slicing and dicing, throwing kind of behind the backs, the cutting the back door, doing everything to you guys. Um but yes, I do take exception to shooting 33 threes in 40 minutes. That is I think, insane. I think 
if they're good threes, which most of them were, then I'm all right with it. Let me um, let me quote Stephen A. Smith when I say, "Lay off the threes." That, that's not what he said. That's not a direct quote. No, um, I think yeah. There, what I saw in the Valparaiso game though was that this team at times would pass up layups for threes. That is what I have a problem with. If you're passing up a good lay, a good look at the rim for a great look at three, I still think anytime you have a good look at the rim, you should take that shot. I'm fine with getting open threes off ball movement, off driving kicks. Um, that's just kind of where I where I draw the line um, is when you're passing up layups. But even still, again, that's the loss that's not going to be, you know, a permanent stain on the resume. I'd imagine this Marquette team is going to be at, at the very least very competitive in the Big East. Um, and so I'm not I'm not overly concerned. And then Iowa is another team that coming out of their loss, they lost 92-84 at Creighton. Not super concerned. Creighton's a, a top 10 team as well. And we talked about how there'd be no defense and a lot of threes in this game. Uh, and that was the case. So, yeah, I don't know. I, I'm happy this Iowa team kind of played with Creighton, to be honest. Because that, that Creighton team is pretty good. Yeah, I think Iowa overperformed in this game. I mean, they were tied at half, only lost by eight. Um, so, and for the expectation that Iowa was going to be not as good this year because they lost their three-point scorers, um, I, if I was in Iowa City, I would not be angry at this result. In fact, but, this would make me optimistic. Yeah, they, they just keep churning out the, the shooters. That's just kind of what what Fran does over there. So, so props to him. Um, but yeah, I, I again, like I watched most of this game, but I was also watching the same night as Champions Classic. I had, I had Kansas and Kentucky on as well. And so, but from what I could tell, especially at the end of this game, uh, Iowa kind of overperformed and they're looking at roughly what, a similar result to last year, maybe, um, being an eight or a nine seed, at least early. Again, I I, I hate making tournament projections in in mid November, but that's kind no, of no, you don't. I mean, I that's like the best way that I can go about per you know portraying what I'm what I'm thinking is by giving him a, a projected seed. Um, but it is way too early to to jump on that. Rutgers goes out and gets a home win against Georgetown to even it up at three. Um, I didn't, I didn't catch all any of this game. I had an exam during it. Um, but it looks like, I mean, what, what, what you get when you go into the rack is you get it. You, you're going to hold a team to low scoring 60 points, um, 35% from the field for Georgetown, seven of 25, 28% on threes. Um, that's what we said this Rutgers team can do. And even though they dropped an early one to Princeton, um, they look like they're going to be okay, I think. Yeah, I think this game signifies more that we know that Georgetown is not back than anything we really know about Rutgers. Also true. Um, I think there was a little bit of some preseason hype that Georgetown might be able to return to some of its former glory with a new coaching regime. Um, but, yeah, I think this was – more of a game that we learned about Rutgers or we learned more about Georgetown than we did Rutgers. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Michigan state beat Butler by 20 and kind of a get right game against, um, against Butler after they lost to Duke. Um, and this game, yeah, I didn't get to catch much of this either, but Tyson Walker goes for 21. I believe he gets hurt at the end of the game because he wasn't able to play on Sunday. Um, this is a game where they move Monty Sissoko to the bench and start Carson Cooper at the five. Um, that's a change that I think, at least for now, is going to stick. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is a game they were supposed to win, and I'm glad they did. Um, and then we have the Vill Villanova Maryland game that we talked about earlier. So four and four in the Gavit games. Um, what are where do you stand with these results? Like what? Did you want like? Did you expect to go better than four and four, and are disappointed? Do you think splitting these with the Big East is is solid enough? What do you think? I think everybody that was supposed to win won, and everybody who was supposed to lose lost. 
probably. Um, I was really encouraged by what I saw from Iowa and very discouraged by what I saw from Wisconsin, Maryland, and you can maybe lump in Rutgers there. Um, I would have liked to see us maybe perform a little better, but we'll take four and four and move on from Gavitt. Yeah, I think Illinois dropping in at home to Marquette. I mean, that's kind of tough, but again, Marquette's a great team. But Michigan reminder got, that Michigan beat beat Marquette one fifteen one eleven. Yeah, and in a game that that was behind closed doors. Um, but yeah, they did. I guess technically. Um, but yeah, uh, I think Michigan makes up for that by winning a game on the road in in the Garden, and so. I think yeah, I, I was kind of hoping for a five and three, um, and so a four and four is. I mean, it's enough. You know, I think the Big Ten, as far as you know, conference versus conference, A B analysis. Um, I think that they're probably on an average year expected to do better than four and four in this event, but I think that's just kind of the state of affairs with the Big Ten right now. Okay, that's enough of the last two weeks let's get into the next you know week and a half of of feast week feast week's kind of a part of the season that i've never really gotten into i think that's going to change this year because there are so many just tremendous tournament fields that i'm just really looking forward to let's start with the big boy the big boy of, the, of feast week is the maui invitational um with purdue best team in the conference um, that field is just loaded. Number one, Kansas, number two, Purdue, Marquette's number four, Tennessee's top 10, I believe they're eight or nine, maybe seven. Gonzaga is number 11, UCLA is in the field, and Syracuse, who's, I believe, still undefeated, as well as Chaminade, the host. Um, Purdue, by the time this video is up, Purdue's game against Gonzaga is probably going to be over, so we don't know, but a win there would get them uh, – do we have a final in the Tennessee Syracuse game yet? I'm assuming Tennessee won, but um, uh, Tennessee did win by 17. Okay, so a win against Gonzaga, which is going to be a very tough one for this team, but um, they're down early. Test. What's the score? What are we looking at? It is 12 to six, five and a half in. Okay, so there's still plenty of time. Um, so yeah, what do you think? Uh, I mean, Purdue may be the favorite early for this tournament, but there's so many good teams that I think you just take that with a grain of salt. Um, you think they, they can survive the loaded field? What do you, what do you think? Uh, I definitely think that they're the favorite in the tournament, but with so many high-ranked teams, um, even if you lose the first game, to, I mean, Gonzaga is not a bad team, so even if you lose the first game to them um, and have to play – whoever Syracuse or whatever yeah it'd be Syracuse. Um, it's yeah I don't think any unless you lose to Syracuse or Chaminade I don't think that you can really be like mad about anything that happens in Maui I think they need to come out I think for them they probably need to come out of this with one loss I think going one and two is not going to bode well for this team I think if you if you lose to any one of those high-end teams that's fine it's just, I don't think you can lose to two of the high end teams. You need to either finish fifth, win your first one, and win out um, third, and you win, the, you lose the second one, or lose the championship or win out. I think you can drop one uh, and be fine. But I think if you want to maintain that you're one of the four best teams in the country, or, or you know, four is kind of arbitrary, but that's kind of, you need to go at least two and one in this. Um, what's your biggest fear? What do you think? You think there's a chance they get exposed at all in this tournament? Because there's a lot. I of mean, really yeah, because coaches. they're having to play. They're having to play their first competition of the of the year, and it's early in the year where you haven't really fully worked out all your kinks yet. So, I think just there are so many. I mean, the coaches in this tournament are tremendous. Outside of Painter, like we mentioned, with all the teams, Bill Self, Mark Few, Rick Barnes, Shaka Smart with hair. Um. Mick Cronin, just a lot, a lot of really good coaches. Um, and we know that Matt, Matt Painter, especially in the non-conference, is a regular season wizard. And so I could 
I mean, obviously last year they go undefeated in the non-conference. This year, it is a possibility that that could happen again. Um, we'll see. If Edie – and Edie never gets into foul trouble, but if we could get a Hunter Dickinson-Zach Edie matchup again, an old-fashioned Big Ten matchup, um, that, that could potentially be an outcome that, that that's possible. Um, as well as Marquette, their their five man was Oso Igadaro, who is kind of and I guess KJ he reminds me of KJ Adams, um, but he's small and athletic, uh, and that could give Edie problems potentially on the defensive side of the ball if executed correctly. And so, I'm just waiting for a team to be able to abuse Zach Edie. It just it seems to never happen, but it seems like it should be able to, and so. Maybe someone will do it in this tournament. Again, a lot of, of really good players and coaches. Uh, Wisconsin's playing the Fort Myers tip-off. They are also playing today. I don't know. Has that one started? Do we have a, do we have a uh, No, there? it's not started. That, that game's in about 45 minutes. Okay, it starts at 5 p.m. Central, um, 6 p.m. local time, I believe. Fort Myers got to be in the East, Eastern time zone, right? Yeah. It's in Florida. Um. Yeah, but not all Florida's in the East. In the, Eastern time zone. The panhandle is in the central. Uh, I have have, my Florida geography is not, not ideal. Um, They play Virginia. uh, And that, that's going to be a good litmus test for this team. Number 24 in the country, Virginia. Um, And I think that they're kind of in, they need to, they they have a get right spot in this tournament because a win here would get them either West Virginia or SMU. I guess a loss would also get them either one of those teams. Um, I think this team going 2 and 0 would be absolutely massive for for what we've seen from them so far in the season. If they were able to win this Fort Myers tip-off tournament, that would just be a huge spot for them to get right and you know, put themselves back in the conversation for that tier 1 of the Big 10. I don't know that I've seen enough to where I can think they can win it though. I think um if Virginia shoots the ball well, they can beat anybody, as you've seen in previous years. Um, and West Virginia, especially, but even SMU, aren't bad teams who can't take advantage of some weaknesses from some slow white guys from Wisconsin. So I don't know that they – I don't know that I like their odds to win the tournament. I don't, I don't like them any less than anyone else, but I think that – any one of those, I don't think SMU is, you know, a, a favorite to win it, but any one of those other three teams, I think they're all probably about equally as good um, at any given moment. The Big 12 is obviously probably the best conference in basketball. Virginia is a great regular season team. And so I hope that this team's able to bounce back. That's kind of, that I'm just kind of hopeful that that ends up being the case. Um, Michigan is playing in the battle for Atlantis. Um, this field is also loaded. I, I've, I've become a fan of the battle for Atlantis more so than the Maui, I would say in recent years. And this Maui field is, is just, you know, crazy, but battle for Atlantis is, I think it's staked its claim pretty firmly as the number two, um, number two preseason tournament in, in college basketball. Yeah, I mean, anytime that you get a um, destination location that can get um, some big name teams, you're going to get other people who want to come because everybody wants to be on the beach in November um, and playing basketball in a nice warm place. I forgot that the sponsor of this tournament is Bad Boy Mowers, and that makes me love it even more. That's a, that's a great sponsor for the Battle for Atlantis. Um so you mean Mich- the Maui Jim Maui Invitational isn't as the good? The Maui Jim Maui Invitational is great. Is it? I don't think is Maui Jim still the still the head sponsor for? It? I don't know who the head sponsor is anymore, but that's who it used to be a while back. Yeah, that that was awesome. I loved whenever they'd have to read that on the air. Um, no, now it's the All State Maui Invitational. Yeah, that's not nearly as clean. I don't, oh I don't my like gosh. that at all. That um, is just so ugly. Michigan will play Memphis on what Tuesday. Or Wednesday. Yes, Wednesday. Wednesday. Uh, that is going to be a good one. I know Memphis, they just released the AP poll a couple hours ago. Memphis unranked. Uh, probably should have been ranked, though. 
Uh, I think this Memphis team is is pretty was it is pretty pretty strong. Um, and I'm excited to see where Michigan stands compared to a a, a really highly regarded uh, mid major in a team like Memphis. I like their chances to win the tournament. Maybe that's Ooh. a little optimistic me as a fan, but I like their chances. They've got Let's to play see. Memphis and then play. They'd play Arkansas more than likely if they won. Sure, um, yeah. And Arkansas is pretty they'd good. They play UNC they or Villanova, I think, are the other are yeah. the two Carolina major Villanova. teams. Yeah, seen. Texas Tech as well as up there. Uh, and Texas I think it's definitely good. within reach. I'm not saying it's like I'm not saying go bet the house on it, but I'm saying it's within reach that they could do that. I'm trying to look at Memphis. If they decide to rebound the ball. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I know because Arkansas is really, really good. Um, and that I think that if you can get over that hump, I think Villan I know Villanova is really good. I I know Armando Baycott is really good. I haven't watched Carolina play this year, but I know him and RJ Davis are both pretty good. Um and Texas Tech has Pop Isaacs. Uh, again, I what a name, it. by the way. I love Pop Isaacs. That's a great name. Um, I haven't watched a ton of, of Texas Tech basketball yet either. Um, but there, there are a lot of good teams in the field. I could definitely see Michigan being a two-win team, and they, they're they not a team that I'm sitting here looking at this field and saying they can't win it because they can. But they're just a lot of good teams, and I think Memphis is a, is a hump to get over. I think Arkansas is probably the second-best team in the field. So I think if you if you can get out of those two games, um, Villanova, Carolina, whoever, I think that those are winnable. Um, what are you looking for in this tournament? Is there anything that you want to see Michigan like get right as far as I mean, defense probably just as a defense whole, and really. rebounding would be yeah. preferable. Yeah. Um, hopefully we can. Phil has some way to correct all that. Yeah. Um. Okay, the ESPN Events Invitational, Penn State is taking part as well as um, Texas A&M, I know, is their first matchup on uh, on Thursday on Turkey Day. Uh, Texas A&M is really good. Watch them. Uh, they, they beat Ohio State pretty firmly. Um, and, and Penn State is not very good, which is worrying for that game. Uh, they've, they've started out the year – Okay, and it's been against some some lower level opponents, but this is going to be a good test um, to see where they're at compared to a team that's better than thirteen of the teams in the Big Ten. But yeah, I just I'm uh, reading some schedules here. Penn State crushed Delaware State crushed uh, St. Francis, Pennsylvania, and crushed Moorhead and beat Lehigh by uh, by nine. So, and none of those are really uh, major tests to the program. No. Um, I mean, Lehigh's had a couple good teams for, you know, a Patriot League school. Moorhead made a couple tournaments recently. St. Francis, Pennsylvania, I think they've been a 16 seed relatively recently. But, like, yeah, nothing – that really jumps off the table at you. Um, they're likely not going to be a and but because Wade Taylor the fourth is tremendous. Um, but Ace Baldwin's really good. You know the reigning A10 Defensive Player of the Year, and so they they have a. I think they match up fairly well. Uh, a win would likely get them. I don't want to say likely because I just watched Florida Atlantic lose to Bryant. Um, and that's a bad loss. Um, but Florida Atlantic and Butler would be the second game that awaits in this field. Um, this is an interesting, interesting tournament. Interesting group of teams. I don't know. I, I could see this going any number of ways for Penn State. I really don't know what to expect until I see them play some high major teams. It's just kind of, or any conference games, yeah. for that matter, because that's all that really matters. The for jury them. is still out on Penn State because we haven't seen them do it against a team that's close to it to a Big Ten level. 
VCU is in that field. Um, so there is a chance that Mike Rhodes is going to end up playing the school he left last year. So and the school that East Baldwin left as well. Um, that would be that, a little narrative, yeah. uh, narrative writing. We'll see. We'll see if, uh, if the script writers have that one in the cards or not. Um, I feel like the college basketball script writers are the most loose of any sport. I feel like there are a lot of outcomes. Uh, I kind of look purple for a second. Have I looked purple this whole time? I haven't been looking at you I'm much, Thanos. to be honest. Um, this, this light is this is not my normal setup. Um, I'm purple. Um, but yeah, no, the script writers for, for college basketball tend to, I feel like, they have the loosest reign on the sport. I feel like there are a lot of expected outcomes in a lot of sports, and it's just the nature of the sport. Um, there are a lot of upsets and and whatnot, and I don't know. I just feel like there's – I feel like they, they honestly have no clue if, if VCU and Penn State are going to play. I could see that being a, a fifth place game in the game. It could be a, a consolation championship in that field. Um, if you had to say right now, is Penn State for real? Is this Penn State team a bubble team? Or no. No? No. You don't think so? No. You, were, you, you thought they'd be the worst team in the conference, correct, initially? They would be down there. Because you – I love you, you prematurely tweeted out the Minnesota is not the worst team in the conference before they they're you know, not, collapsed they're not, against Mizzou. They're not the worst team in the conference. They're so still, yeah, the jury's still out on that, obviously. Four months of basketball left. Um but yeah, I think I think that they they have a shot. They have a shot at being for real. I don't, I'm not gonna say they are, but they have a shot. They have a path. Um I've never heard of this tournament, but the Rady Children's Invitational. Uh, I think it's takes, something new that's recently started. It's taking place in San Diego. Iowa is going to play Oklahoma on Thursday afternoon. Um, and then, depending on if they win or lose and the outcome of the other game, they'll play either USC or Seton Hall on Friday. I I kind of like Iowa's chances against an Oklahoma team early. Yeah, I don't know much about Oklahoma, um, but Iowa has the guys to be able to hang with anybody, as you saw with Creighton. They can just shoot the shoot the lights out of any night and go win any game. So we talked about last year, we talked about how shooting doesn't always travel. Uh, and that kind of scares me in a way, but at the same time, on a neutral site, I could see, you know, the rims being pretty, pretty wide, you know, and I don't mean like that they're actually wider, but they're going to rig the rims. Is this what you're saying? No, I'm saying they're not going to rig the rims, but shots shots fall maybe more often on a Do neutral we need side an investigation into this? No, I don't think so. I'm not. I'm not alleging that. Um, yeah, I, I think this Iowa team. I mean, they have shot makers. If they make shots, then and this is what we said last year is just like if they're going to make their shots, then yeah, they, they can they can absolutely win the game. That's just Iowa's a make shots team, and. You know, you could say that about a lot of teams in college basketball. You know, if you make shots, you're going to win. But Iowa, to the highest degree, is the definition of a make shots team. I mean, it's basketball. You have to score to win. Every team is a make shots team. And it's true. You have to score at least once if you want to win any basketball game. At least yes. one score is is required. Um, I don't know. I'll keep an eye. We'll keep an eye out on on that tournament field as the week goes on. Not a tournament, but a fun neutral site game that takes place in Palm Springs. Michigan State going to play Arizona uh, and continue their just buzzsaw of conf- of non-conference opponents. Do uh, you think they can, they can steal one against the number three team in the country in Arizona? I don't because Arizona went to Duke and beat – beat Duke at home and then Duke went and beat Michigan State neutral site at a what it was essentially I mean Chicago is like three hours from Lansing so yeah um when and it's like 13 from from Duke so I mean playing this and seeing how Michigan State has struggled against good teams to make shots I think Arizona squeaks this one 
Yeah, I I, I was going to go transitive property if you weren't. Um, it should be a really good game, I think. Hopefully Tyson Walker's back healthy for this one. Um, in the Acrisure Classic. Um, Acrisure is kind of making a name for themselves. Again, going off of basketball and talking about something completely random. Um, and they get the naming rights to Heinz Field. It'll always be Heinz Field, but I'd, I'd never heard of Acrisure until like last year. Um, I feel like they're popping up all over the place now, at least in the sports world. Um, AJ Hogarth against Caleb Love will be fun, at least on the Arizona offense end of things. Because Hogarth's a great, he's a really good defender. Um, I'm curious to see if that's the matchup that they they go with or if they try to I'm, – I'm curious to see what looks they throw. And I think Omar Balo is going to definitely provide problems for Michigan State, regardless of who's out there, if it's Ahsoka, if it's Carson Cooper. Is, you know, is Jackson Kohler hurt? I don't know. I just – I feel like I haven't seen him out there as much. Um, Omar Balo is going to provide a problem against anyone, I think, from this Michigan State team. All right, and then final final Feast Week tournament, the Emerald Coast Classic. It's already started. Um, Ohio State played their, their I guess, on-campus game against Western Michigan, and they got a win there. Um, and so they're going to end up playing Alabama in Florida on Friday, um, the on Black Friday. Um, and that should be a really good one, right? Alabama and, and Ohio State. That's uh I think Alabama's much two better high powered offenses. Is. Um Jalen Milrow and, and Honda McCord going going head to head. Should oh, be geez. should be a good one. A little playoff preview, perhaps. I doubt that. Both of those teams can't make the playoff. They, they both can. No, but they won't. I don't think they will either. But they, they both could. No, they couldn't. They they definitely could. There, no, there's, it'd be so. I mean, Ohio State. There's not win. enough spots left. If Ohio State wins the Big Ten and Alabama wins the SEC, they're both going to get in. No, like they're that's, not. That's yes, that's a lock. I don't. Not. Okay, whatever. <laughs> okay. Um, FSU is going to win the ACC. Georgia will still be in. Ohio Bama State will be in, Georgia, and then it'll be Oregon, Washington, and Alabama won't make it. If Bama beats Georgia head to head in the SEC title game, they're both going to be twelve and one, and Bama will have the head to head win. It's the same thing. Bama with Texas. won't. Yeah, but Bama won't be in, and Texas won't be in either. It's going to be Washington. That, I mean, Florida State. If Washington and Florida State both get in, it's just going to be those two, and it's going to be the Big Ten champ and the SEC champ. No, it's going to be Georgia. If Bama beats Georgia, then they will go ahead. Bama's at like eight. Yeah, or but nine. if they beat Georgia, they would jump Georgia. That's just how that, that's how that would go. That's not how the committee works. Yeah, it is. I'm certain that that is what would happen. Anyway, this uh, Ohio State, Bama, and basketball. Um, I don't know. I haven't watched any of Alabama play. Uh, Ohio State's been been what we've expected. I would say um, Bruce Thornton kind of stepping into that lead role uh, at the guard spot. I feel like Roddy Gale has been pretty good. No. Yeah, both those guys averaging about 15 a night. Zed Key, I believe, is coming off the bench and scoring scoring 12 points a night. Jameson Battle stepping into that spot. Um, it's a fun team. And so if they're, if they're able to get a win against Bama, they'd get a championship game against likely Oregon um, or Santa Clara is, is the other option. They're, they're already in the winner's bracket, so they'll get one of those teams um, – I think I think Ohio State is a path to win this, to win this tournament. I think I don't see it. I think Bama. They have to beat Bama. Obviously, I mean, if they want to win the tournament, they have to win. Um, Thank you for that wonderful analysis. Yeah, no, I just I felt like the people needed to know that. Um, I think I think Bama's. I don't know if Bama's great. I think Ohio State can beat Bama, um, and I don't know if if it's a fifty fifty. I think I might give a slight edge to Ohio State, but I'm biased. I've seen them play more. Um, but I think they'd beat either of the other teams. And so I think the winner of the Ohio State Bama game will likely be the champion of the, of the field. I think that's a bold take, but I guess we'll just have to wait for what'd you say that's on Friday? We'll have to wait yeah. on Friday to figure out. Yep. Uh, a lot of a lot of really good basketball. Feast week, like I said, I, I haven't been the biggest feast week enthusiast in the past, but this year I just don't see how I couldn't be. Um, and so 
a lot of basketball that's going to be on. Um, so make sure you check all, all those games out. Um, and by the time that we'll be filming our next episode, we're going to be getting the first wave of conference games. They'll be, they'll be coming up. Um, and so we'll, we'll preview those and we'll recap all these, all these tournaments that we just talked about. Um, so yeah, um, you have anything else before we can wrap it up? Uh, yeah, I guess I'll agree with you a little bit that feast week normally was something that just created large quantities of games, but maybe not very high quality games. Um, but I feel like the tournaments this year, um, are giving you a little sneak peek at what March might look like, which as we all know, is the most wonderful time of the year. Yeah. By a landslide. Um, and I feel like there's been a lot, I've seen a lot of complaints on Twitter. I know Jeff Goodman, especially. Um, oh, geez, Jeff Goodbaum can shove it. Yeah, well, they, they, they've they been complaining a lot about the week early, early season schedules for all the Power 5 teams, how they won't schedule each other. Well, that's because they're playing in these Feast Week tournaments that are just loaded. Um, and so this is where they're getting the majority of their quality non-conference games. Um, and so I, I, I'd trade it off. I'm happy with getting a couple good games early and a ton of good games this week than it being evened out over the course. And there are a lot of, you know, uninspiring games for championships in these tournaments. I think more people are going to be drawn to watch a tournament on feast week than a regular, than in than a regular season game. And so get more eyes on the, on the better games. I'm, I'm fine with it. I don't have a problem. I generally land in the camp of whatever Jeff Goodbum supports. I don't. So I agree with you here. Yeah, no, I I, I remember um, at some point last year, uh, the Field of Sixty Eight, uh, his podcast. They they were tweeting out a list of the hundred best follows for college basketball content on Twitter, and he was number. And two. we made the we made the cut, didn't we? Who? What do you mean? No, oh, we no next yes, year. Yes, next we year definitely we'll, did. Okay, we okay. will likely be on on the list. Uh, Jeff Goodman ranked himself number two. And I remember seeing someone tweet like a, a photo of Obama, like putting the, the Medal of Honor on himself. It was like that meme. Uh, and I know so, what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah that, that <laughs> was hilarious. Made me laugh out loud. Um, so, yeah. Um, yeah, so that, that's all we got for the episode. Um, I'm excited for, for Feast Week and you know, to do the next one whenever we, we have a, a better idea of where these teams stand uh, compared to the rest of the conference because we're going to see more high major games. Um, super exciting time of year. Um, probably the most exciting part of the non-conference schedule by, by a, a landslide. So so I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. Anytime you can just eat food and watch basketball, sign me up. Yep, absolutely. Um. All right. Well, like we said earlier in the video, links in the description for Twitter, TikTok, uh, YouTube, Apple, Spotify, wherever you want to listen or get updates from. Um, make sure you check all of those out in the link tree. Wherever you're listening, give us a like and subscribe. Wherever you're not listening, go there and also give us a like and a subscribe. Um, follow us on Twitter. Follow us on TikTok. Um, Thank you guys for, for listening. I know this was kind of a long one, um, but I had a ton of fun. And we will talk to you again in two weeks or so, maybe a week and a half, uh, whenever all these tournaments are wrapped up and we're getting ready to to start our first leg of, of the Big Ten. Gobble, 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 gobble. I don't know what that was, but uh, yeah, thank you guys for, <laughs> for watching. And uh, we'll see you next time. It's Feast Week. <laughs>